Hi guys! So, if you don't watch Rationality Rules, you definitely should. We really like Steven's channel. He offers some great content, mostly relating to reason, logic, philosophy, and, well, rationality. Presumably, because it rules! <laughs> If you're unfamiliar with him, you may not know that he recently made a video about why he thinks veganism will win, but also why he isn't vegan, and why most people alive right now aren't vegan. And as vegan activists and fellow YouTubers, we feel a responsibility to respond to his claims and give our counterpoints to the ideas he presents. I think that I have a compelling reason as to why I'm not vegan, and indeed as to why most of us are not vegan. Now, his video is quite long, so we'll do our best to summarize his arguments and use clips from the video to back up what he's saying. But if you haven't seen his video in its entirety, you definitely should, if you feel so inclined. He's not the typical anti-vegan troll. No. In fact, he's seemingly close with Cosmic Skeptic, Alex O'Connor, who went from a mostly secular, skepticism-based YouTuber to a full-on ethical vegan activist in a very short period of time when he was presented with the arguments for veganism. The crux of the point that I want to convince you of today, or help to elucidate, perhaps if you already believe, is that non-human animals are members of our moral community and deserve to be treated as such whether we like it or not. There's actually a video from three years ago when a non-vegan Alex O'Connor debated veganism with a vegetarian Stephen Woodford, Rationality Rules, and a non-vegan Rachel Oates. So three non-vegans discussing veganism, uh, but with Stephen being the one who actively wanted to have the conversation. You're a vegetarian. I am, yeah, and uh, I'm gonna get in trouble for not being a vegan in this video. <laughs> As for Steven's latest video, he starts it off by throwing some shade at Sam Harris for eating restaurant steak, which was almost certainly factory farmed, while at the same time claiming to be a consequentialist who cares about maximizing well-being and minimizing suffering. In his moral landscape, he champions the thesis that morality is about maximizing well-being and minimizing suffering, so consequentialism. So I'm, I'm basically a, a consequentialist. And yet, when he gave up on veganism due to dietary needs... I do eat meat. I was uh, a vegetarian for, for six years and began to feel that I wasn't getting enough protein. Which is a premise I'll grant for sake of argument. What did he do? Did he attempt to figure out what exactly his body was missing, say, protein, omegas, iron, or vitamin B12, and then source the animal products that can supply this with the least amount of suffering caused? No, he went straight for steak, straight for a highly developed social species, a mammal with much of the same physiological apparatus as us. Now to us, this is sadly pretty average for most people. It's pretty predictable. Most people claim to care about animals and yet they pay others to needlessly confine, torture, and kill animals. Stephen then clarifies that he doesn't have an ethical argument against veganism, but also that he doesn't buy the case for ethical veganism? Right off the bat, ethical veganism and veganism are synonymous, but we'll table that nitpick for the sake of this response video. Let me make clear from the outset that I'm not claiming to have an ethical argument against veganism. No, I'm merely going to provide two reasons as to why I don't buy the case for ethical veganism. This is uh, odd. If one can't come up with an argument against something, is it intellectually honest to say that you don't buy the case for it? I mean, if I can't formulate an argument for child abuse, but I still choose to abuse my child because I just don't buy the case of anti-child abuse. Would that make any sort of meaningful sense? It sounds like a lazy statement, like claiming he doesn't have a good reason not to become vegan, but that he's just not gonna. Because... Yeah, it's like the mirror of Bill Maher's I don't know it for a fact, I just know it's true segment, which is a comedy sketch, it's not an intellectual argument, but let's hear him out and respond. First, he cites the Effective Altruism Foundation's strongest argument for veganism, which, by the way, is not like a definitive strongest argument, it's just what the foundation claims, but it's fairly solid. The argument is as follows. Premise 1. We shouldn't be cruel to animals. That is, we shouldn't harm animals unnecessarily. Premise 2. The consumption of animal products harms animals. Premise 3. The consumption of animal products is unnecessary. 
Conclusion, therefore, we shouldn't consume animal products. Stephen then cleans up the language a bit, and he steel mans the argument by polishing it, as he puts it, which does add clarity, and it includes the very important factor of intent. Premise 1. We shouldn't harm sentient beings unnecessarily. Premise 2. The deliberate acquisition of products from sentient beings harms sentient beings. Premise 3. The deliberate acquisition of products from sentient beings is unnecessary. Conclusion. Therefore, we shouldn't deliberately acquire products from sentient beings. And so, in order for Stephen to refute the argument, he must reject one of the premises in the argument, which he does. But before he does, he again says something confusing. Remember, I'm not arguing here that veganism is unjustified. I'm merely explaining why myself, and I'll go on to argue why I think most people are not vegan. So he believes veganism is justified, but he chooses not to be vegan. Again, little weird. If I said, I'm not arguing here that racism is justified, I'm merely explaining why myself and others are racist. Would you accept that as a compelling argument? Stephen goes on to reject premise one. I reject premise one, and for two reasons. Let's spell out the first. As vegans are well aware, vegan diets raise many moral questions of their own, and one such question is this. What does it mean to say that the deliberate acquisition of a product is necessary? Necessary for what? To again quote Doggett, if it is wrong to hurt chickens for me, is it wrong to hurt mice and moles while harvesting crops? If it is wrong to harm workers in the production of meat, isn't it wrong to harm workers in the production of tomatoes? If it is wrong to use huge quantities of water for meat, isn't it wrong to use huge quantities of water for almonds? So again, the question is, what does it mean to say that a product is necessary? Is it to live, and if so, to what degree? Is it to live a fully healthy life, or just to live at the cost of, perhaps, a reduction of optimum performance and lifespan? Or at least a reduction in some of the foods we enjoy that are technically vegan, such as almonds? Like, seriously, where's the line here? So, he's kind of doing crop deaths though here, as well as a little bit of appealing to futility. So we'll tackle appeal to futility first. If we're interpreting what Stephen is saying correctly, it seems he's saying that for example, you don't need almonds specifically to survive. And since almonds use a lot of water, you shouldn't eat them. But then that becomes almost like an infinite regression. Like, sure, we don't specifically need almonds for protein and fat, so what if we choose avocados? Well, we don't need avocados specifically, so what if we choose beans? Well, we don't need beans specifically, so what if we choose lentils and so on and so on and so on? Yeah, I mean, one could argue that any given plant-based product is unnecessary on an individual level. You don't need each individual product, but then we suppose what we are left with is the reality that by simply existing, we will inevitably cause harm. It's an appeal to futility. It is futile to avoid causing harm there is no way to cause zero harm without simply not existing. Also, we know that definitively, animal products are completely unnecessary for human health. As we've cited numerous times, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics released a peer-reviewed statement confirming that well-planned plant-based diets are perfectly adequate for optimal health from birth through old age, including pregnant women and athletes and bodybuilders and people named Steven. Plant-based diets are perfectly adequate as long as they are well planned. And we know that plant foods are 100% required for human health, unlike animal products. So of the two categories, one actually is necessary, the other is not. Assuming you have access to a well-stocked grocery store or restaurants or Grubhub or any of the plethora of things that Steven himself has He's access to. To have, yeah. yeah. How does the vegan determine that their life is worth more than the mice and moles sacrificed in their crops? If the avoidance of harm is so paramount, why does one human life supersede a thousand mice or a million insects? Avoidance of harm isn't paramount in veganism. Avoidance of exploitation, and yes, harm by association, is the main concern for vegans. And by consuming whatever small amount of animal products like eggs and dairy, Stephen contributes to direct animal exploitation. Yeah, there is no collateral harm, so to speak, in animal farming, even in dairy and egg production. It is all direct. To produce eggs, farmers deliberately breed chickens into existence, male and female, and then deliberately kill the baby males on their first day of life because 
they will never lay eggs. They're not profitable. And then, deliberately, they manipulate the females into laying as many eggs as possible for about 18 months or so, and then they deliberately sell them to be slaughtered for chicken nuggets when their egg production becomes not profitable. Because people deliberately purchase the products. It is direct animal exploitation from top to bottom, and the same is true of the dairy industry. Now, let's address crop deaths, though. This old chestnut is one of carnists favorites. <laughs> we think because it sounds like a really good point on the surface, but doesn't really make sense when looked at with any amount of scrutiny. Yes, vegans pay for plants to be farmed, and in that process, some number of animals and insects are killed in the process of harvesting those crops. However, if we simply look at the data regarding how many crop deaths occur per million calories in multiple food categories, clearly the way to reduce crop deaths the most, as Stephen seems to want to do, is by eating plants. That only makes total sense because cows and pigs are bigger than us and they eat a lot more than we do. Yet what we do as a species is we clear acres and acres of land to grow plants to then feed cows, pigs, and chickens, and then we kill and eat the cows, pigs, and chickens. Not we, but people. People. We feed and slaughter 70 billion animals every year. Imagine if we only had to feed 8 billion humans. Do you think that would entail more or fewer crop deaths? And also, vegans aren't thrilled with the crop deaths that we cause. We want veganic farming to proliferate. We want better methods for growing plants and feeding humans. This right now is unfortunately the best system we have so far. Granted, not everything is big ag, but the very least we can do is to stop directly exploiting our fellow earthlings and as a result, reduce the number of crop deaths we cause. Stephen also seems to bring up the desert island though argument, but he's given it a soft reboot. He frames it as lost at sea though. To illustrate this principle, suppose an ethical vegan was lost at sea with shipmates. If harming sentient beings can be justified in the name of continuing one's existence, then the vegan would eventually be justified in killing a shipmate for sustenance. Hell, with time, they'd be justified in killing everyone on the ship. These arguments never make much sense to us because vegans are never talking about these exceptionally specific and rare circumstances. Stephen isn't lost at sea with shipmates. He lives in England with, as he admitted, a plethora of affordable, accessible, plant-based foods. Within the last five years, the vegan options offered in the south of England have massively expanded, with pretty much every restaurant offering fantastic vegan alternatives at affordable prices. This has made my transition towards veganism significantly easier, and it's immensely helped normalize veganism. But what about countries that are not socioeconomically privileged? This is always bizarre when, when carnists do the what about tribes people in Africa though? What about uh, people in Iran who, who farm goats? What about people who live in the Amazon? Yeah. What about people who live on Pacific Islands? We are not talking about those people. We are talking about people that have access to and the ability to afford going to places like grocery stores, like fast food restaurants, like Starbucks, people that can afford things like Instacart and Grubhub, people that You don't have, have to the, afford need those things even. You no, can, I mean- You, if, you just if, have to have access and- If you have access to go buy things like uh, the corpse of a chicken or a cow or a pig, but right next to it, in the same store is the rice and the beans and the lentils and the oats and the produce and the, the veggies and the fruits and the oat milk is right next to the cow milk and the, yeah. the vegan cheese is right next to the non-vegan cheese. You have choices. We're simply asking people that have the choice to make the ethical choice. Stephen's second reason for rejecting premise one is that he believes most people don't really agree with premise one as written, but rather he proposes they believe something different. While most people say that they affirm the premise that we shouldn't harm sentient beings unnecessarily, I think that what they're actually affirming is we shouldn't harm our kin unnecessarily. He goes on to explain how our kin is simply an arbitrary category in which we choose who to place and who not to place. This brings us to the eminent vegan philosopher Peter Singer, who has captured our kin in his term, the circle of altruism. Who precisely is in our circle of altruism? Who do we consider our kin? Is it just our family, our tribe, our nation, our continent, humanity itself? What about mammals, or indeed all sentient beings? Now this may very well explain why the majority of humans today aren't vegan, but it doesn't justify it. 
If, as I argue, we're actually running the software, we shouldn't harm our kin unnecessarily, and who we consider to be our kin is subject to external factors, including resource abundance and education, then we don't have to buy the extremely costly proposition that most people alive today and throughout history are moral monsters. No, to the contrary, we can make perfect sense of historical institutions such as tribal warfare, imperialism, and slavery. Simply put, their circle of altruism wasn't as expansive as ours, and just as most people alive today are genuinely not bothered to hear of a pig's torturous experience because they don't consider the pig within their kin, I strongly doubt that our predecessors were all that bothered to hear of a slave's torturous experience because they didn't consider the slave within their kin. Here, Stephen is saying that our ancestors weren't moral monsters for enslaving other humans because they didn't include black people in the category of their kin. But they could have, and in fact, there were some people who did consider all people, all humans, as part of their kin. Those who advocated for abolishing slavery. Those who advocated for equal rights. So just as some people chose to include black people in their kin, or they chose to include women, or the LGBTQ community, or whatever other morally irrelevant category you want to place people in, Stephen could choose to include non-human animals in his circle of kin. He's just seemingly more concerned with justifying the actions of past humans instead of justifying his own actions today. Whether you agree with me or not, surely you can see the explanatory scope of my view. It makes a lot of sense of historical moral development and also contemporary moral disagreement. It's a consistent story. Mm, the story may be consistent, but it doesn't give good reason to arbitrarily put cows, pigs, and chickens in the category of other in order to kill them and eat their corpses, especially with the present knowledge that they are sentient. What exactly is the morally relevant trait they possess or lack? Stephen simply says, they're not our kin. Why? Because we've decided they're not our kin. That's not a reason. That's the oppressor decreeing that the victim shall be victimized. He's appealing to the majority. As the age of information prospers, living standards increase, and readily available vegan alternatives become the norm, our circle of altruism will eventually expand to encompass all sentient beings, and those who don't share the relevant intuitions will nevertheless live by the vegan ethos, since their well-being is tied to tribe acceptance. He admits we will be a vegan world someday, but not because it's unethical to harm our kin, but because our circle of altruism will eventually extend to all sentient beings. Making it unethical to harm our kin. It's like he, he just doesn't want to include dairy cows and chickens in our circle of altruism because they're not, but they will be. <laughs> but that doesn't just magically happen on its own. We need to be a part of the movement. He seems to have this belief that we're stuck in our current place in the timeline of the universe, even though we are aware that we can change. Like we're just, we're stuck in the present. We can't look forward and make predictions. We can't look, you know. Back and learn well, lessons. Well, we can learn, according to him, we can look back and learn lessons, but we can't use those lessons to make changes To make today. changes going forward. As we learn new things and as vegan products become more readily available, eventually it'll happen. You could do it right now, Stephen. You could choose to go vegan right now. About 95% of what I consume is vegan, which as said earlier, necessitates the death of countless moles, mice, and insects. But to be more honest with you than I probably should, when I reflect upon this, I just don't greatly care. But why? Where's the logic? If I won't eat a mole because it effectively decreases my well-being, why don't I lose sleep over killing moles for my crops? And crucially, know that necessity just isn't relevant here. What's relevant is my circle of altruism, my emotional state, and yet it's completely inconsistent. Not only in what species are within it, but also what members of each species are within it. Why? And the same is true, though to a far lesser extent, when it comes to the consumption of meat. If one consumes cows, pigs, chickens, and so on, then they are, over their lifetime, going to commission the exploitation and suffering of a staggering number of sentient beings. His concluding segment reminds me of when carnists ask, who would you save in a house fire, a chicken or a human? <laughs> well, obviously in that very specific and rare circumstance, the details matter. Do I know the chicken? Do I know the human? Is the human 102 years old with a terminal illness and the chicken is a newly hatched baby? Is the human closer to the front door than the chicken? Is the human an asshole? <laughs> yeah, obviously as individuals we might have illogical emotional preferences. Like, I value the life of my wife 
more than the life of a stranger, but that doesn't mean that I go about my day intentionally killing strangers needlessly because I value my wife more than them. So why not murder because I love my wife? Thank you, honey, you don't mm. have to. With all of this said, however, during the month it's taken to produce this video, I further reduce my dairy and egg consumption. And if the world keeps going the way it's going, I'll probably be vegan within the year. I mean, we're happy that Steven seems somewhat motivated to eventually cut out all animal products from his consumption. We're just disappointed in the arguments that he put forth in this video. But it won't be because I buy the ethical vegan argument. It won't be because our circle of altruism should extend to all sentient beings. No, it will simply be either one, because my circle of altruism will extend to all sentient beings, courtesy of socio-economic and environmental privileges, or two, because my tribe circle will extend to all sentient beings, and because my well-being is tethered to my tribe. And because my well-being is tethered to my tribe, I'll sing their song. It won't be because he buys the ethical vegan argument, and it won't be because everyone's circle of altruism should include all sentient beings, it'll be because Stephen decides to include sentient beings in his circle of altruism, or as he says, his tribe circle will extend to all sentient beings. If he will decide to include other beings in his tribe circle, doesn't that mean he thinks you should include those beings in your tribe circle, Gracie? <laughs> what do you think? It seems like he's pushing back on the, um, the moral obligation of it. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm not obligated morally to do this. I shall decide to do yeah. this. So the ethical vegan argument isn't convincing to Stephen now, but it will be convincing later when the rest of society falls in. And then, and only then, it seems that Stephen will decide without the moral obligation to act in accordance with the ethical vegan argument. Basically, this just sounds like Stephen is not willing to be a leader in the movement, but rather he wants to be a follower. Because let's be honest, most likely we would assume he just wants to keep consuming dairy and eggs. With the title, veganism will win, but you're wrong about why, it seems like we're not wrong about why, according to Stephen. Our circle of altruism will inevitably extend to all sentient beings. And so by extension, wouldn't it then be unethical to needlessly harm those within our circle of altruism. We know he's saying that right now, many don't view non-humans as our kin, but that's only because right now, some people are choosing not to. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please let us know below if you had any thoughts about this video from Rationality Rules. Do you think his arguments are sound? Do you think they're not sound? Let us know below. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to all of our Patreon patrons. All of the money that you donate on Patreon, all of the money that we receive from Etsy purchases goes directly towards our Animal Rescue Fund, supporting Tony. Tony is our rescue rooster. He's a handsome boy. Uh, he's a special needs rooster. He did have an amputation. And we're able to give him the care that he needs because of your generosity. And if you're watching and you're not a Patreon patron, you haven't bought anything on Etsy, but you're like, I like this channel. I like what they have to say. I get value out of their content. Please consider becoming a Patreon patron. Even if you only want to make a one-time donation, the link is down below. We got some backlight throughout the video there, huh? We used to be so perf like such perfectionists about Lighting like we just sound. realized the cat fountain, the water fountain is on behind us, and yeah. we're like, oh man. Yes, you're gonna hear water in the background. Yeah, but that's fine. If you want to start a YouTube channel, don't let that deter you. By no. the way, people shoot videos. People just like, hold their iPhone. They just, just go, they just yeah. Click the red button. What you know? matters is what you have to say. Mm -hmm. People yeah. want to hear your perspective. You don't want to get caught uh, preparing to begin. Preparing what is it? to get ready to begin. Preparing to get ready to begin, yeah. Just, just do it. Just do it. Yeah.